So, hey, everybody, thanks for stopping by. Today, I am talking to Canadian Member of Parliament, Matthew Green. He's from Hamilton Centre, the NDP, New Democratic Party. And we're going to be talking about how he laid the smackdown on Jeff Bezos last week regarding the news that he was going to be cutting the wages of Amazon workers. And we're also going to talk about the broader significance of wealth taxes, wealth inequality, and how corporations are trying to use this crisis to enrich themselves while regular working class people really, 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 really struggle. So Matthew, thanks for joining me. How you doing? Man, it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate your work. I appreciate the platform. Shout out to you and everybody out there on left who tuning in today. Yeah, Matthew's been doing a great job as a member of parliament. He's a rookie MP, but you know he's a longtime public servant at the municipal level, bringing that skill set to the federal scene. You know, a real good, strong left voice in the NDP and in, in the public discourse. So, Matthew, last week, you know, Amazon announced, uh, Amazon Canada, but I believe it was a North America-wide decision, that they were going to be rolling back their quote-unquote heroes pay. They basically created a couple of new provisions uh, that were, you know, raising the, their wages and also giving extra overtime. But by the end of May, those bonuses would be gone, even though the work remains dangerous. And even though, you know, uh, online shipping is at a torrid pace and the workers are being grinded down. And this was reported on by Press Progress. And you tweeted out the following, and I'm going to read it out. And this is not a channel where we have a lot of profanity, but I'm not going to sugarcoat it. He says, fuck that wannabe trillionaire. This is class war. Whose side are you on? So what was going through your mind when you were tweeting that? Look, the only thing I've seen in that tweet was a story that referenced the fact that while simultaneously America was set to give birth to its first trillionaire, while simultaneously that same company was rolling back on a lot of the jingoistic corporate rhetoric around heroes pay and around actually giving a shit about their workers. Yeah, no, no. Again, I think that was a great point. And that's, and that's a fantastic point that during this week, it was not only Amazon's doing really well because online companies have you know, flourished uh, at a time where a lot of brick and mortar stores have to close down or, or reduce services. And it's not only that you know, they're rolling back this pay, but it's that there was all of this reporting, a lot of it positive, bafflingly, about how you know, on pace for 2026, Bezos could become the first billionaire because trillionaire he's worth about 150 or so billion right now. And, you know, you juxtapose all these things and you're right. That's the true obscenity. And I, I, there was a real debate with a lot of people on the one side, Matthew saying, you know, this is, uh, this is not the way to approach politics. You know, their monocles shattering in their champagne flutes. Whereas I think a lot of people uh, really uh, agreed with not only what you said, but how you said it. There's definitely a chattering class of liberals who would prefer that the NDP just go away so that their obvious preference for corporate Canada isn't made exposed. But the reality is that there are companies like Amazon and Amazon is not the cause of the evil. It is a symptom of a greater evil of profiteering in a new robber baron era that is predicated on, on COVID on a, global pandemic and a global tragedy and a disaster. Case in point, within months of this thing starting, Bezos himself accrued like 24, 25 billion, billion extra dollars. And I think the challenge that most folks have is that they make this false equivalency between real true labor and wealth. Yeah. That somehow somebody can earn a billion dollars. Yeah. They cannot. You cannot earn a billion dollars. You take a billion dollars and you take it on the surplus wages of your workers who are the real ones providing you and the rest of society with their value. And how do we know that? Well, they're hiring at record paces. How do we know that? Well, if CEOs stay home, the economy doesn't come to a halt, Christo. But if workers <laughs> stay home, yeah. we know what happens, which is why in these current and, and, and probably in the weeks to come, the increased pressure to reopen the economy is never about the good and welfare of workers and working class people. And what I mean by that is I'm not talking necessarily just about those who are making minimum wage. I'm talking about everybody yeah. who found themselves in this pandemic 
one or two paychecks away from either not being able to pay their mortgage, their rent, or put adequate food on their table or cover any of their other, you know, many, many costs that they have in life. For sure. For sure. I think that's a great point. It's, it's affecting, you know, the broad working class, you know, those who are extremely precarious, but even those who at least week to week are maybe a little bit more stable, but again, are always one small tweak away from that very same precarity that a lot of people have. And I think that, you know, people have started to see that during this crisis. And I think that, you know, specifically, you know, our current government, Justin Trudeau's liberals, you know, on the one hand, I think, as you note, they portray themselves as the party of the middle class and those trying to join it. But we saw them make a sweetheart deal, for lack of a better term, with Amazon earlier on in this crisis, you know, in lieu of working with the unionized public service postal workers. I wonder if you can maybe fill people in a little bit on what they did with the liberal government. Well, so they came out, it was very unclear from the get-go. It's that, again, the liberal narrative is that corporate Canada is going to ride, you know, to the rescue in the middle of a pandemic. They, they brought on uh, Amazon to be able to handle some of the logistics on the distribution of the critical supplies that need to go through all the levels of government. And they've done it on the back, I'm told now, on the back end. But we were unclear. We were unclear because the challenge is, in situations like this, as you identified in your intro, governments and liberal conservatives and conservative liberals will use this opportunity to position the private sector as being really the efficient, best way to deliver public services. So rather than use Can the Post, which has been underfunded and has been maligned for you know, the better part of the last decade or so, uh, instead they shifted to Amazon as the savior. It now has emerged that they will continue to use Canada Post and Purolator for delivery. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is, is that what we already know, perhaps folks that are watching don't, the Canadian Union of Postal Workers right now has been without years without a contract. Yeah. Yeah. There is going to be a pressure post-pandemic for increased privatization of public services. Yeah. There's going to be what they call austerity, which really means tax cuts for the ultra wealthy and cut social programs and services and public sector for everybody else. And so for me, I look at Amazon as a toehold right now on the logistics side, yeah. Yeah. because what they actually do, if you talk to any expert related to Amazon, and you, know, you look to Tim Bray and others who have since left the company, yeah. is their web services are really where their profit is at, yeah. and their supply chain stuff is like their loss leader. Yeah. So they can basically give that away to corner the market. And what does that look like? Well, that looks like really terrible working conditions. It looks like union busting, you know, direct interference on whistleblowers. It looks like, you know, COVID deaths in the US, pushback in France. You know, it looks like the hiring of thousands of extra workers to keep up with the demand and the record profits while simultaneously cutting back on their already minimal wage. We're not talking about a living wage. They essentially consign their workers to live below the poverty line while simultaneously based on their high efficiency, track and monitor every single heartbeat of their worker from yeah. the moment they walk in that warehouse. Yeah, 100%, 100%. It's the automation of the human surplus value, for lack of a better term. Yeah. It is, the, it is the, the digital apocalypse that is being hoisted upon us through this, these capitalist systems. And you're seeing it in other industries as well, you know, truck drivers, for instance, and, you know, the monitoring of them, you know, in a way that, 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 that pales even in comparison to, you know, relatively high levels of monitoring. This, these are not punch clocks anymore, right? Like, no. you know, these are, these, are, these are, you know, systems that are integrated almost in a biological sense, right? Um, if I could, on, yeah, if I well, could just on that point, which is an important point, yeah. um, is that in this new conversation of working for home, I yeah. think the very valid critique has been put out there for many people. I'm, I'm sure yourself and others yeah. have noted this. Yeah. Uh, there's going to be an increasing reliance for the individual worker to take on the costs of internet, cable, technology, and significant in increased surveillance yeah. of their work by working at home. Uh, Shopify just yep. recently announced that they're not going to go back to bricks and mortar because they've recognized that for them, this could this could really present significant cost savings on the capital expenditures of their, of their, uh, of their budgets and their, and their uh, 
um, yeah. profit and loss statements. So their workers are going to be subsidizing their rent. Yep. No. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I noticed that too, is some people really jumped on that, you know, and, and, and talked about that. And I think this kind of leads us into another question, which is, you know, when we talk about who needs assistance in this time of crisis, there's been a real debate. I mean, I know that you and the NDP caucus and a lot of progressive Canadians have really pushed for help to be aimed at working class people, small businesses, those who are really struggling, and even some larger employers, but only those employers that, you know, sort of play by the rules. But the liberal government has been less than cooperative in that with regards to who should get help and who shouldn't. I wonder if you could fill people in a little bit there. Yeah, and I'll, I'll pull it back before yep. I charge forward on that. I'll pull it back <laughs> and say, particularly to here in Ontario, where we have some of the highest incidences, we have some of the highest mortality rates. You know, there's over 6,000 people across the country who have died from COVID. This is a national tragedy that Isn't we it? haven't even begun to mourn in the scope and scale of the absolute personal devastation that's caused so many families across this country. But it starts with, in my opinion, here in Ontario, the legislation of poverty through social assistance, through Ontario Works, through ODSP, those two features, and I'm sure it mirrors all across the province, are so low and so legislated in their poverty, so low below the low income cutoff line, that it suppresses wages to force people into unsafe environments because they have to make the choice about whether or not Again, they're going to be able to cover and pay their rent or whether or not they're going to you know, provide whatever assistance is allotted to them. So in the system that we have, the value of people in this country, whether they're citizens or not, young or old, it doesn't matter. Their value is calculated on the formula of what they contribute to the gross national product, which is why EI was set up to ensure that only the folks that were working can have access to that. And not even coverage. that, really. Let's be honest. Yeah, and then, be, and then below that, yeah. you know, the cliff that you fall on below that yeah. is Ontario Works. So as a yeah. worker, you're saying, I don't work and I collect Ontario Works, which in Ontario is 1,200, uh, sorry, 700 and change for a single person. And I think, you know, 1,300 for ODSP, which is our disability. Or I take the EI and try to get back into the workforce, which is, you know, 50% of the wages and so on and so forth. So it forces them back into the work environment. What we said in this critical moment from day one is that we needed to ensure that every Canadian who needed, regardless of means testing, and I'll get to that in a moment, got and received direct money directly into their bank accounts as soon as was logistically and bureaucratically possible. The liberals in their first iteration relied on the means testing, the liberal neoliberal program of your value of work worth as a worker by stating that they were going to have these two or three other programs through EI and they were abysmal. In fact, one of the programs they couldn't even define and say how much people were going to get or how long they were going to get it for. So they actually took us up on our recommendation, which was to provide at a, at a low level, at a floor level, $2,000. We said to everybody, and what the liberals do is what they do best is take a great idea and liberalize it. And they created so many different means testing that it essentially screened out the people who needed it the most. Exactly. Yep. Just, just for, yeah, for like, so for my American audience, the NDP was basically proposing what Bernie Sanders has been proposing, which is a universal $2,000 monthly payment to everyone who needed it. You just go on to the, the government website and you click a couple boxes, you get the money. Um, but what the liberals ended up doing is creating that, which does cover a good amount of Canadians. The program has helped people, but it leaves out people that were already unemployed. It leaves out people that weren't making, that hadn't have made $5,000. It leaves out uh, a lot of the students who had summer jobs lined up, but their jobs were canceled. It leaves out a lot of people. Uh, uh, Estimates were about a third of people who were rendered unemployed wouldn't have access to this. And and I think that's a real shame because the the original goal was to provide something universal for working people. And the, and the other shame, the continued shame, again, I'm going to go back to it because it's so important, yeah. is that at the federal level, they identified that at the bare minimum, just to struggle to get by, the average person would need $2,000 a month. Exactly. It's yeah. $24,000 a year, which is literally the, the low income cutoff now if you were to look at the cost of everything. Yeah. For well, sure. simultaneously, people who are on ODSP in Ontario Works are expected to make their way through this pandemic 
on a, on a fraction of that, on $700 to $1,200. And so my hope through all of this, Christo, is that a lot of the aspirational liberals, a lot of the young students, a lot of the urbanists, the professional creative class, you know, the Richard Florida creative class dream, who have been completely left out, a lot of small businesses, yep. solo entrepreneurs, yep. people who are sole proprietors, left yep. out. Yep. Traditionally, sure. these people are liberal. And they yes. turn to us and they say, well, what are you going to do about it? And our response has always been that we are demanding for a universal application of this. It's the liberal government who is refusing to do this. They have the votes in parliament. They can do it working with the NDP. They can do it with straight you know, rationale, working with the bloc. Yep. Yep. But I'll tell you this, a month and a half before COVID actually hit, we proposed that they extend the sickness benefits for EI yep. from 15 weeks to 50. And everybody in the house supported the motion except for this liberal government. And yep. to that, th that will always be a shame for them. No, I mean, look, I think that's a fantastic point. You know, this government is saying on the one hand, we want to help regular people, but they're leaving out the most vulnerable people, mil a million Canadians, maybe more. Uh, and, you know, they've made tweaks since then, you know, for instance, if you made even $1 a month, you couldn't get any of the CERB, uh, which again affected a lot of these uh, uh, freelancers and, and entrepreneurs. They listened to the NDP there. They made it so that you can earn at least $1,000 a month. But you know, there's still lots of people left out. But I think you make a fantastic point that we've basically shown, at least in broad terms, that you need $2,000 a month to survive. And nobody on social assistance is really getting that anywhere. I'm in this I, I, I want to put a caveat on that. I'm unclear that that's true. I don't want that to be the assertion because I don't believe that you can get by on $2,000 a month. I think what's yeah. happening is that, that people who had the ability to, because we do have essentially a, a debt financed existence in Canada, are still heavily relying on deferment payments. They're relying on any lines of credit that they have. They're relying on their credit cards. So I think the real shock is going to come in May and June yeah. when those bills become past due. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good and point. And so I, I don't, I don't want to give any kind of assumption that $2,000 a month is enough to get by no, as a livable I think, wage. I think that's a fair point. I think that's a, certainly a fair point. But I, you know, if, 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 if 2000 scraping by for a lot of people – then 980 something, whatever, you know, is, is certainly not enough, especially in uh, urban Ontario, right? You know, it's, it's economic just, violence, Christo. Yeah, 100%. There, so there's a, a large conversation about, yeah. you know, about social murder. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think right. this COVID pandemic, and I'm not, look, people watch this stuff and they think this, this is hyperbole, you know, F a trillionaire, you know, this is just hyperbole. People are dying in the streets. We've been talking about this even before COVID. Even before COVID, we knew SEIU and other unions across the country were raising the alarms yep. on long-term care, the privatization of our, of our healthcare system, our retirement homes, our group homes. People are actually dying and now they're dying in significant ways. Yeah, no, you're a hundred percent. I think like, you know, it, it just really shows because this government on the one hand, you know, they're like, we're, we're going to have the wage subsidy is to help corporations they basically then went on to say that it won't be available to any company that dodges the taxes. And then the next day in English, they said, you know, they said the first part in French that only companies convicted of tax evasion would be ineligible. And basically no companies in this country get convicted of tax evasion. So we have a wage subsidy program that's also going to benefit some of the largest, most powerful companies that, 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 that sort of uh, screw the Canadian taxpayer the other 50 weeks of the year when they didn't need emergency aid. And I, and, I, and I think that my hope is, much like you, that you know, out of this crisis, we see systematic change. And some of this is going to have to be at the provincial level as well, but you know, the federal government's going to have a big role to play. I know John Horgan, the BC Premier, and Jagmeet Singh, federal NDP leader, have both suggested we need to weave in federal sick payments. We need to build a standard, maybe using the EI system, there's been a lot of talk about how uh, maybe in some way or another, the CERB might need to continue. Uh, it, needs to, it might need to exist long term uh, to, to be something of a, a universal floor for people. There's been even some discussion about how you know, we need to weave in healthcare, weave in long-term care facilities into our uh, Canada Health Act to ensure that we ban private healthcare 
uh, with our most vulnerable seniors, people with disabilities and things like that. And I'm wondering if you could touch on some of that a little bit. Ooh, Christo, it's Friday, man. I, I tell you, this is like fired up Friday for me. It's yeah. tough for me not to get fired up on this because let's, let's just call it what it is. In 2019, we ran on one of the most progressive platforms in a generation. It called yeah. for the extension of pharmacare. Yeah. Imagine what public universally applied pharmacare would look like right now in terms of cost savings for Canadians. We talked about building 500,000 affordable homes across the country. We talked about a just transition and a green new deal for workers yep. to ensure that the catastrophe that is the oil sands provides workers with, a, with a, a safe and just transition into a renewable economy. We did all of that stuff and we continue to do it. We continue to fight for dental care. We continue to fight for 10 paid six days, sick days, which we just, you know, introduced. We introduced the M1 motion for a Green New Deal. All of the bones are in place for us to have a transformative experience at the federal level. The challenge is, is that all of the advancements that we have fought for during COVID have, have resulted ostensibly in a bump in support for the liberal government. Yes. Even yeah. though they're half measures. Yeah. And I mean, whatever. At the end of the day, this is a national emergency. I am okay with the liberal party, you know, taking credit for the full measures of the work that we're proposing. What I'm not okay with is for them taking great ideas and watering it down through the capitalization of liberalism yeah. and capitalism to a point where what I know is going to be true, that once this comes back that all of these companies who have been simultaneously accessing tax havens yeah. and receiving billions of dollars of corporate subsidies, including yeah. the oil and gas sector who get subsidies on top of subsidies. Yep. Yeah. That when the bill comes due, conservatives and liberals alike, liberal conservatives and conservative liberals alike are going to call for increased deregulation, privatization, and suppression of wages. Yep. That they're going to try to wholesale all of public sector services. Canada Post, well, look at Amazon. Housing, look at their national housing strategy. We're going to give money through a national infrastructure bank to developers and corporations to build. There has never been a corporate Ponzi scheme that the Liberal government and the Conservative governments alike have not salivated over. And that's what we're after right now. We need to be clear with Canadians that right now the tax loopholes in this country, based on the polling that you have provided, it's common sense. You ask anybody, regardless of their political stripe, should the ultra wealthy pay more? And uniformly, they say yes, except for that 1%. 87 families in this country have more wealth than the lowest earning 12 million Canadians. Yep. That is a scandal. That's not a bug of capitalism. That is the feature that it is yes. hyper concentrated wealth because we have created a system. We have created a system that requires 5,000 low income seniors and low income precarious people to come to my constituency office to file basic returns on their fixed incomes in order to get all of their other benefits and supplementary, supplementary incomes while CEOs and all the families, look at them all. Look at Irvin Oil. Look at like just right yeah. across the West Ends. Look at them yeah. all to yeah. see who's accessing this funds right now while simultaneously they get record profits. Yep. And so that's what's got me fired up is we need to have a modernization of a fair tax regime. Shout out to Toby Sanger at Canadians for Tax Fairness, the folks at uh, CCPA, Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. This is the thing that I'm going to come out swinging with in the weeks and months to come, tax fairness, yeah. to ensure that the ultra wealthy pay their fair share, to ensure that they do not have or we limit their ability to shuffle their money offshore while simultaneously they profit off of the publicly funded social infrastructure that we already have in place here. Yeah. Oh, you got me fired up, man. It's fired up Friday. <laughs> No, I think that's great. You know, the, the polling we're talking about, uh, just earlier today, Abacus, one of the polling firms here in Canada, uh, did a poll asking Canadians if they would support a 1% to 2% wealth tax, uh, basically as an alternative to uh, making any sort of cuts to help fund the recovery process from this, you know, social and political and economic crisis. And a vast majority of every political party 
including 69% of conservatives. So again, for my American viewers, imagine if you could get 70% of Republicans to agree on a tax on the wealthy. It's broad, it's, it's, it's pan-partisan. Uh, it's 75% of Canadians overall, the vast majority of people who vote for the NDP and the Greens and the Liberals, uh, you know, uh, all support this policy. And I think it's something that we definitely need to explore. In the last election, as Matthew notes, the NDP ran on a program of tax fairness, a 1% wealth tax on all wealth, I believe above 20 million it was, and also a, you know, a, a tweak to the capital gains rate to ensure that you know, uh, people who earn their money through rent seeking and profits don't get such a major advantage over people who earn their labor, earn their wages through labor, be it by hand or by mind. And I think that that's something that we as progressives, both sides of the border in parliaments and just on the street need to be pushing because if there is going to be, you know, a financial reckoning after this crisis, the working people should not bear that, that, that brunt. Yeah. Yeah. Let's put this in perspective, again, because I think the biggest challenge we have when we're educating workers, there's this like false myth, this, this just world fallacy of capitalism, that somehow these people have earned their wealth, that they've earned it because the average worker goes to work, they get paid their hour times their wages, which is their revenue, they're making 30, 40, 50, 60, $80,000, who knows. But for billionaires and trillionaires, this is not the case. Most of their money is made off of capital. Yeah. They are making money off of money in ways that nobody else has access to. And to give you some perspective of that, okay, a trillion dollars, that's the obscenity that we started with in this conversation, is a thousand billion. Or put another <laughs> way, a billion dollars is a thousand million. Yes. So this makes one trillion, one million million. <laughs> That's yeah. inconceivable for people yeah. to think about. And yeah. let's put this into perspective in terms of earning because people, again, when they think about their labor, like Jeff Bezos works, gosh darn it, he works real hard. He deserves to have a trillion dollars. Let's talk about that. If you made a dollar a second, okay, $60 a minute, in an hour you would make $3,600. If you worked the entire day, 24 hours, you would earn $86,400, okay? To earn a million dollars, you'd have to count nonstop for 11 days. How long would it take to get to a billion? 31.7 years. Yeah. How long would it take to get to a trillion if you were to make a dollar per second? It would take you 31,688 years, fam. <laughs> that is a lifetime of like everybody on the world like put together. It is inconceivable. Yeah. It's older than just, modern human civilization. Yes. Correct. Yes. And the only reason why that's so is because we have these tax regimes that allows companies like Amazon, who I, to my knowledge, and I've asked the question, don't pay federal taxes in Canada, don't pay federal taxes in the United States, don't pay their workers adequately, bust unions, break their workers' rights. So yeah. there's no such thing of earning a million. You take it yeah. and you steal it from your workers. Yeah, 100%. And in a just economy, in a democratic economy, let's talk about that, in yeah. a democratic economy, not only would workers have access to their own means of production, but they would have shared benefit and reward from that. No, for sure. I mean, I think these are all things that we have to hammer as, as you know, progressives, as leftists, as democratic socialists to ensure that whether it's on the taxation front or on the economic democracy front, we're putting forward an alternative. And I know the NDP has a committee that is basically talking about rebuilding Canada in a better way, not only solving uh, the, the issues that have arisen in the last, you know, month and a half, two months, but the issues that, that, uh, caused and exacerbated this crisis. And I think that we're look, definitely going to be seeing more from that. Matthew, this has been fantastic. Always happy to have you on. Before we go, where can people find you? Uh, talk about your parliament for the people yeah, uh, you know, show. Talk about some of that stuff. So inspired by, you know, early conversations, I've been having this ongoing conversation with my friend Christo, whom I met on Twitter, a big fan of your work, been following your stuff online here for the better part of a year and a half. We talked about this during the election. I felt committed to connecting people to the process of government and the way that I've done that is through live streams. It's now 
been created, this idea of parliament to the people. You know, if you can't bring the people to the parliament, although I've done that too, we're going to bring parliament to the people. So I have a daily segment that airs at 3 p.m. every single workday uh, on Twitter and Facebook. I multi-stream and you can just check out hashtag parl to the people or you could visit me at Matthew, M-A-T-T-H-E-W, Green, N-D-P for both Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much for having me on today, Christo. And I look forward to, to seeing the, uh, the responses and engaging with the comments that are going to undoubtedly come from this. Matthew, thanks again. Uh, I wish you all the best. Thanks for keeping up the good fight and uh, keep telling billionaires off whenever you can. If you can't say F a trillionaire in today's day and age, man, you better gut check in on that. 100%. Thanks again, Matthew.